one of the most common things that people will YouTube when they are starting Dungeons and Dragons is of course how to create a character. Now, this is not going to be a character creation guide for a specific class. What I'm going to be going over is the aspects of a character sheet along with tools you need for creating a character. So for starters, the tools you need is you need the player's handbook. Uh, it's about $50 at your local uh, comic book store. Other books that are helpful for, to you will be the Dungeons Master's Guide and the Monster Manual if you are leaning more towards being a Dungeon Master or just want to be a more knowledgeable player. Other publications of, from Wizards of the Coast can aid you, uh, such as Vol's Guide to Monsters includes a variety of different races that are playable in dunge in the uh, as official published products. Uh, Unearth Arcana, which is in the link in the description down below, which is the uh, part of the community feedback form to make 5th edition more enjoyable also provides different class options, subclasses, archetypes, races, etc. that can help you and rule sets also to help you learn the game. Uh, this is going to be a part of a little series where I go over how the game actually functions. Now the first thing like I said is today's video we're going to focus on the character sheet. So this is the typical character sheet. This is the one that Wizards of the Coast actually gives you for free which is in the link in the description down below. It's pretty straightforward. It's three pages and um, lots of characters only really use the first page. The second page is purely uh, cosmetic and the third page is for spell casting. So we're going to go over these three pages today. So the Dungeons and Dragons character sheet. So the top form is character information. So what your character's name is, um, the class that your character is playing or the classes if you're multi-classing and your character's level. Your race goes here. So are you a human? Are you a gnome? Are you a warforged? That goes there. Your background, which is an aspect of the uh, player's handbook, which will be covered in a later video, uh, basically gives a, an official idea of where your character is from. So a good example like this is uh, you can have the background soldier. Your character could have once been a part of a guard of a village. Uh, he held a rank and um, something came came up for him to either no longer be part of the guard or leave his village and pursue with something else. Uh, backgrounds give us uh, a variety of different things like different skills you're proficient in, some starting items, etc. There's a block for your alignment. Your alignment is the nature of your character. So uh, is your character neutral, meaning they don't really care what happens as long as it doesn't affect them? Uh, are they an evil nature where they're going out in order to hurt people? They're specifically targeting someone for a uh, bad intent, an evil intent. Or are they a good nature where they are... Um, out there to do the opposite. They're out there to make the good imprint, to uh, stop the evil intents and uh, protect those who need it. This is where your alignment goes. And then there's also a spot for your player name, so what your name is, and how many experience points you have. For also in the player's handbook, list how many experience points are needed to level up, and you keep track of total experience points there. Next, there's a box right here called Inspiration. Inspiration is a tool that the Dungeon Master will give you. In an event where you do something heroic, amazing, uh, funny, whatever the Dungeon Master deems, something that gives them a reason to give you a stack of inspiration, uh, it functions exactly the same as a Bardic Inspiration would. It's uh, a dice roll that you can add to pretty much anything. Uh, but there's no, other than birds, there's no way to gain inspiration other than the Dungeon Master. So this is commonly not used. I personally don't use it, but other Dungeon Masters use it quite a bit. Next is the proficiency bonus. The proficiency bonus is a set scaling as you level up. It's the same across every single class, whether you're a homebrewed class, Wizard of the Coast official published class, it does not matter. For example, level 1s have a plus 2, 
and level 20s have a plus six proficiency bonus. Proficiency bonus is added to anything you are proficient in. Uh, you refer to your player's handbook in the class section to tell you a specific number based on your level. And um, so a good example of what you would add to this is uh, if your character is proficient in um, using the long sword. When you make an attack roll with the long sword, you add your proficiency bonus to it, which gives you a more likely chance to hit your target because you have a plus X to your roll. It's good to point out that the proficiency does not go to damage rolls unless it specifically says in the text to add to it, uh, such as a spell would, but um, there's not very many of those. Next, there is your six main stats on the left-hand side of your character sheet here. There is strength, which is about the physical shape of your character. Um, so this is not generally how muscular a character is. You can be as skinny as you want and still have a very high strength. Strength is just pretty much your, um, your capability to uh, lift things, uh, swing things, uh, use things so uh someone who has a 10 in strength is going to be able to use a weapon like a great sword but someone who has a 15 in strength is going to be able to use the great sword a lot easier it's not as heavy to them uh someone with 15 strength can carry up to 150 pounds but someone with 20 strength can carry up to 200 pounds so the more strength they have determines that aspect of what your character is capable to do Dexterity is the next stat. Dexterity represents how nimble your character is, how uh, how fast your character is able to react to something, um, how smooth they are. So if you are a blacksmith, you need a good dexterity because you need to have nimble fingers to be able to put things in the right slots so that way you don't break something. If you disarm traps, you need to be very careful with it, but very swift. Because if you get one thing wrong with the trap and your finger slips, you can blow up, depending on the trap. Dexterity is also a measure of speed. Uh, it doesn't in impact your character's actual speed, but it allows you to do a variety of checks that we will uh, look into later on that are related and seen as a speeded movement. Constitution is the third, and this is your character's actual health. How healthy your character is. Uh, are they like meat shields with an 18 constitution? Uh, they Their skin is pretty tough. Uh, cuts and bruises don't really affect them. Deep wounds are just flesh wounds to them. Uh, do you have a lower constitution to where um, you bruise easily? So uh, you know you're not the you're not the highest hit pointed person, but um, you're not you know deathly ill or anything. Or do you have a very low constitution, which means you're very susceptible, uh, susceptible to injuries? Uh, you get hurt very easily. Constitution uh, affects not only physical health but uh, internal health, uh, such as poisons. Um, diseases, illnesses, they are all measures of constitution. The next two stats are stats that are very controversial. Intelligence. Intelligence uh, demonstrates your character's, um, well, intelligence. But people always assume you'll get the case like uh, a barbarian with an eight intelligence, and people assume that that means the barbarian is stupid. It doesn't. Eight intelligence means the barbarian would not necessarily be knowledgeable. They wouldn't have learned a lot of things. So if you have an eight intelligence, you don't not know how to speak. Your speech patterns aren't very well, but you may not know how to write very well. Um, you may be a little bit confused when someone does something like a math problem. It's more of you're not as educated. You're not stupid, but you're just not quite as educated in certain fields as other people are. Uh, but someone like a wizard who has, let's say, a 17 in intelligence are very knowledgeable. They have studied for many years in a subject and know what they're talking about. That's intelligence. 
Wisdom is how wise a character is. So this is where really it determines how smart a character is. Do you know not to piss off that dragon? Do you know that this person is lying to you? Do you know that a fireball in the forest will cause a forest fire? That's all based off wisdom. Are you... Are you smart enough to know not to use a fireball here? Are you smart enough to know to not run up and punch someone in the face randomly without good reason? That is wisdom. And wisdom is a measure um, that a lot of spellcasters use, mainly the wizard, um, for uh, their spells. Uh, if they're not a sorcerer who has to, who has spells naturally and they have to learn spells, uh, wisdom is the act of learning. Intelligence is knowing, wisdom is being able to learn. And charisma is the last stat, and that is your um, your ability to be social, your social aspect, uh, your ability to talk with others, to make jokes, to demonstrate feelings, to deceive people. Anything that would involve um, you speaking to someone or trying to do something for someone to believe is an act of charisma. So uh, trying to stealth is an act of dexterity, but trying to deceive someone that you are not who you say you are is an act of charisma. Passive wisdom is uh, another word for uh, passive perception. Passive perception is simply your um, your uh, gut feeling. So passive perception is 10 plus your wisdom modifier. And uh, that is also determined in the player's handbook. And this is a like a natural, you know where things are moment. So when someone does a stealth check, it's your passive perception that determines whether or not you see them or not. And we will go over that in a later video. It is uh, a measure of just uh, awareness. You are aware of your surroundings or you're not, depending on your, uh, your perception. But this is something that you don't roll. Uh, it's always up. Next, we're going to move into saving throws. Saving throws are desperation acts. They're something that's bad going on and you need to act fast, such as dodging a fireball, such as um, resisting an attack, um, jumping over a sudden ledge. Uh, acts like that are all measured in saving throws and have a respective score for them. Uh, they use your ability modifier for the stat that they fall under. So strength, obviously, your ability modifier for strength. If you're proficient in this ability saving throw, which is listed in your class in the player's handbook, uh, then you add your proficiency bonus along with your ability modifier. The same thing applies to the next section of skills. Skills are things that you can roll for specific acts. So if you're trying to jump over a ledge, it can be a, uh, an athletics check or an acrobatics check. These are dungeon master specific of what they feel it fits. However, it tells you what score to use uh, in brackets behind each one. Uh, so for acrobatics, you use your dexterity modifier. And just like the saving throws, if you're proficient in it, based on what you're given when uh, in, the, in the player's handbook when uh, creating your character, um, you add your proficiency bonus to the ones you're proficient in. Next, we are going to move over to the armor class. Armor class is uh, basically determines whether or not you get hit by an attack or not. Armor class is based off the armor that you are wearing, if any at all. If you are not wearing armor, it's a flat 10 armor plus your dexterity modifier. Uh, and different types of armor listed in the player's handbook give you more armor. Uh, all the way up to plate, which gives you 18 armor flat out. Uh, when someone makes an attack against you, it's against your armor class. So if they wrote a 15 on their roll and you have a 16 AC, you do not get hit. But if you have a 13 AC, you get hit and they roll damage. Initiative is when you're able to go in a turn order. So a basic turn in Dungeons and Dragons is six seconds long in game time, uh, but could be minutes for an actual player's time. You add your dexterity modifier into the initiative spot and that's an extra addition to your roll. 
So when you roll your d20 for initiative, if you have a plus three dexterity modifier, let's say you roll a 15, well now you add plus three to that 15, which gives you an 18 uh, initiative. Your speed, which is the next box here, is determined based on your race. So for example, human, it is 30 feet. Uh, majority of races are 30 feet. And this is uh, how many feet you're able to move with your movement action. Um, you can get ways to increase your speed, but, uh, and there are other ways like um, giving up an action to do the dash action. So you get two movement actions. Uh, but this is just how far you can move in a turn. Your hit points are how much health you actually have. Your hit points are determined in your class section and you gain so many as you level up. Uh, some classes gain a lot more than others. When you hit zero hit points, you are unconscious. You're unable to make actions and you have to make death saving throws, which we will get to. If you fail three death saving throws, your character dies. Um, if you succeed to uh, death saving throws, you stabilize and no longer have to make them. But until you are healed through a means, you stay unconscious. Uh, the only way to instantly die is if you take enough damage that not only do you get knocked down to what would be zero hit points, but you take damage that equals half of your maximum HP. So let's say you have 20 maximum HP and you take 30 damage. Half of your maximum HP is 10. You took 20 damage to zero and then you took another 10 damage to negative 10, that's instantly killed. However, let's say that you only took exactly 21 damage. Well, you got hit by 20, so you're at zero, and then you got hit for one, which would put you in negative one, but you stay at zero. You only go into negatives if it would be an instant kill. Temporary hit points are ways for you to gain um, armor, in a sense, but basically more hit points. Uh, these come through sources of magical abilities, spells, and whatnot um, that your DM would give you throughout your journeys or that your class is able to give you. And they, they are hit points that cannot stack and uh, are taken off before your current hit points. Temporary hit points, they don't stack because let's say you get one person who gives you eight temporary hit points. And then you have another person who casts some time that gives you nine temporary hit points. Instead of gaining eight plus nine, you just simply go from eight temporary hit points to nine temporary hit points, gaining one, the higher value. The reason that they don't stack is because they are a short-term solution to a sticky situation and they're not designed to stack uh, unless it specifically specifies that it can stack which some spells do allow you to do that so when you take 20 damage but you have 10 temporary hit points you only actually lose 10 of your current health because 10 of it gets taken off in temporary hit points the hit dice are determined in the player's handbook by your class uh, you get so many hit dice per level of your class, and you can use them during a short rest to heal hit points. You roll the hit dice, and you can gain that many hit points during a short rest. You regain hit dice after long rests. Your death saving throws. So when you're unconscious, on your turn, instead of attacking and moving, you have to roll a death saving throw. If you roll a 9 or under you fail the death saving throw. And if you roll a 10 or over, you succeed. Some people do it where 10 and under is a fail and 11 and over is a succeed. Uh, really, it's a Dungeons Master call, but the book does say nine, I believe. Next is the personality traits, the ideals, bonds, and flaws. These are listed in the background, but you are able to make these your own. These just kind of flush out your character a little bit. They give uh, the people a little bit more information about who your character is, what their personality is like, um, what they're like in a sticky situation, what their flaws are, what their strengths are. The attack and spellcasting section here is mainly for um, melee weapons and for a quick list of what you're able to do, such as through a magical item. You simply put your the name of your item in the box. The attack bonus, if you're proficient with it, is your proficiency modifier plus the stat modifier that goes with it. So for instance, a strength weapon is generally with strength unless it is uh, 
finesse, in which case it's strength or dexterity, whichever is higher. Um, so you could have, let's say you have a three strength modifier and you're proficient in it, you have a plus five to your attack bonus. And then the damage slash the type, so the damage is the actual dice or damage does. So let's say it's longsword. Uh, you have that three to strength, you deal 1d8 damage, and then you add your strength modifier to it for plus three. And the total is slashing damage. And so when you go to roll an attack, you know how much dice to roll and how much to add on to the result. And there's a little section down here that you can type in or you can write in, type in however you're doing it, your spells. Uh, if you want, for a quick reference, uh, magical items or just more weapons. Next is your features and traits. So you gain features and traits as you level up, such as level four, instead of taking ability score improvement, you can take a feature. Um, you can list that here so that way you know what it does. Uh, when your class gives you a feature, for instance, your level one class, you gain a couple features. Uh, let's say you gain spell casting, you put in spell casting here. Um, and basically you're explaining to yourself what it does, so that way you know fully what it's doing when you go to use it. So let's say you have uh, an extra attack, you type in extra attack and you specify that when you make an attack action, you get two attacks instead of one. And you list this for your archetype, your class, any features you get throughout. Uh, you put as much information as you need. Uh, at the end of the day, if the DM needs more clarification, they have the player's handbook. Next is other proficiencies and languages. So the languages your character speak, which is determined by your race and uh, a fee if you take linguistics, goes here. Uh, tools that you're proficient with, so let's say you're proficient in smithing tools, it goes there. Uh, you are um, proficient in a type of armor and a type of weapon, it goes there. Uh, proficiencies in general, this, this is where they go. Then you have your equipment. So what's actually on your character? How much gold do they have? How much platinum do they have? How much copper do they have? Uh, do they have a great sword, um, leather armor, and adventurer's pouch, etc.? Anything that your character picks up can be stored in here. And that's the first page. The second page is just more information about the character. Your character's name, their age, height, weight, eye color, skin color, and hair color. You have a, a little part here that you can have a picture of them. Uh, allies and organizations. This is so if your character was part of a guard, you could put the type of guard it was, um, their, their allies that they fought with, maybe even the party you're currently playing with. Uh, if your character is someone like a paladin or a cleric, you can put a picture of what your symbol looks like with its name. Uh, there's a small little part that you can put your character's backstory, uh, whether it be a summarized version or the full thing, depending on how flesh you are out with it. Um, and then there's also an additional feats and traits section. Let's say um, you are writing this on pencil and you run out of space and you don't want to go to a loose leaf. There's another little box that you can add it in. Along with treasures. Treasures like things that you find that you won't actually use. So you find... Um, you find a uh, a um, a chest, but you don't want to open the chest right now. So you maybe put chest of goods, so you know that it's on you. Lastly, is the spell sheet. So your spellcasting class goes at the very top. So uh, are you a warlock? Are you a wizard? Uh, your spellcasting abilities. So this is listed in the class of what they use to cast their spells. So for instance, a warlock uses charisma. So you'd put charisma there. Your spell save DC is based off of 10 plus your proficiency plus your spell casting ability modifier. So if you were a warlock and you had a plus three ability modifier in charisma, it would be 10 plus your proficiency plus three. And your spell attack bonus is um, much like with the weapons, how you had that bonus to accuracy. It's the same thing here. It is your ability modifier plus your proficiency. So if you had a plus two proficiency and a plus three ability modifier, you would have a plus five to hit with your spells. And then you have spells from cantrips to level nine. Your class will give you a chart telling you how many spell slots you have, how many spells you can learn per level, and how many of them you can hold. 
Um, for such a uh, wizard is not generally uh, restricted to that for they can they have their spell book a paladin knows all of the paladin spells but they can only have so many prepared and so on and so forth cantrips do not require a spell slot you can use a cantrip and it not cost you anything you can use one cantrip and one spell a turn as long as one of the two is a bonus action. But you cannot cast two spells that cost spell slots in the same turn, even if one costs a bonus action. If you have three first level spell slots, that means that during that time you can only cast a first level spell three times. And uh, you can upgrade spells if they specify. So let's say you have two level two spell slots and you are using uh, the level one spell magic missile at level two. Instead of using the level one spell slot, you upgrade the damage to turn it into a level two spell slot. And then you expend one of your level two spell slots. As you level, you get more and more and you keep listing them in here. Uh, you can put the name of the spell. Uh, what I do is I put the name of the spell and the page in the player's handbook it's on because you can't really fit all of its number calculations and what it does in one line of text. So you have a box on the left, if left is how many spells you have and the box on the or slots you have and the box on the right is how many you've used at that time. And that is the character sheet. For Dungeons and Dragons, we gone over all the stats, every single box. Uh, it's not too complicated. Uh, nothing like the fourth edition character sheet. Oh boy, that's a doozy. But I hope it was useful. If you have any other further questions, leave them down in the comments down below. Have a nice day.